Okay, so my name is Milan Puncher and I'll be talking about high-end audio and the domain of time. So high-fidelity sound reproduction is a field that lies at the intersections of many disciplines and it's one that's filled with controversy and misinformation. So not surprisingly, most consumer audio systems bear a distant resemblance to the sound of live music. Uh, unbeknownst to most people, including many musicians and even audio professionals, there exists two-channel stereo system that comes surprisingly close to the real thing, live performance. So these, uh, th this realm of audio is often referred to as high-end audio, which I'll abbreviate as HEA, H-E-A. Now high-end audio invites a lot of skepticism and controversy because of the extreme designs and materials used in these systems. For example, the audio components that weigh almost a ton, the CD players that use atomic clocks, and the speakers that use solid diamond for the diaphragm. So these kind of measures may seem extreme and superfluous to someone who's not familiar with hair. So naturally, people tend to view all of this, these extreme measures, as snake oil. Can a human actually hear these differences? Or is this basically going too far and you're kind of just making it very expensive uh, as a fashion, basically. So to understand audio and what's involved, it's useful to take a step back and see what consists, or uh, what a musical note consists of. Okay. So the base, a musical note has four uh, principal attributes, which are pitch, loudness, duration, and timbre, or the tonal quality. So reproducing the first three is fairly straightforward. The challenge lies in getting the timbre or the tonal quality right. So musical notes consist mostly of a sum of harmonic frequencies. So here, for example, is a 440 hertz tone. This is its second harmonic, 880 hertz. When you add these together in equal proportions, you end up with this tone A. This has the same pitch as the fundamental, but it has a different timbre, a different tonal quality. So to some extent, which frequencies you mix in and in what proportion does affect the timbre. But those proportions are not as important as you might expect. So in audio, there's something called a frequency response, where the, uh, the point of the frequency response is to make sure that the audio component and the whole system as a whole reproduces all the frequencies in the original proportion. How important is that? Not very. So here, listen to uh, the uh, complex tone A you had before. 50-50 mixture of 440 and 880. Now the same thing with a different, uh, different proportion. Here, 440 is one and a half times as strong as 880. Listen to B. Now A. Not all that different. So much for the importance of frequency response. Now, on the other hand, look what happens when you introduce a time delay. So here you have the fundamental, the 440 hertz, and you're playing the harmonic a little bit later. It begins after a delay. Listen to this, compared to A and the C. You can hear the delay. So this delay actually turns out to be very crucial for timbre once the frequency proportions are reasonably correct. Now a lot of times there's confusion between phase and time delay. People think it's the same. It's absolutely not the same. So here you're adding 440 and 880 in equal proportions, starting at the same time, but with a different phase. So this is the phase of a sine, that's the phase of a minus cosine. So they're out of step, but it's not like uh, there was silence uh, before, as in the case over here. Listen to tone D. Uh, compared to, again, not all that different, but we put in a delay. And you can hear that. So it, as it turns out, timing matters more than both the phase and the amplitudes or the powers of the different frequency component. 
Also, if you add new frequencies, which weren't there at all in the beginning, that can be heard. And that usually comes from distortions. So, uh, to illustrate this principle, look at these two uh, instruments, the harmonic and ocarina. Listen to them and look at their real-time spectra. So, in the case of the harmonica, uh, the energy is kind of distributed more or less equally among all the harmonics. In the case of the ocarina, you'll find that the fundamental is a lot stronger than the harmonic. It's closer to a purer tone. But more important, in the case of the harmonica, all the frequencies rise up at the same time. In the case of the ocarina, the fundamental rises first and the harmonics rise up a little bit later. So listen and watch. Now the ocarina. So watch the ocarina again. You'll notice that the fundamental is noticeably stronger than the other. But more important, it picks up before the rest. There's a delay. Okay. So that, that delay, the alteration and timing, ends up being more crucial than the proportion of frequency, the power spectrum. Now how can you show this? Uh, in, the, in the last case with the harmonica and the ocarina, the spectrum was also different. It's not just the timing. In this example, the spectra are exactly the same. So what's been done is, this is a piano wrote a note which is repeated a few times, and then we'll play that in reverse. So in software, you can, play, you can reverse the waveform so that you have exactly the same thing played backward. So in this case, the piano has a fast attack and a slow delay. Instead, it becomes a slow rise and a fast decay. But if you look at the spectra of the two, they're exactly the same. This is also a mathematical fact. You don't even have to measure the spectrum. But listen to how different the timbre is. So here's the piano played normally uh, in the forward direction. And now reversed. You see, it went from sounding like a piano almost to sounding like, like a harmonica. So this is the point. The timing has a, a bigger influence on the timbre than the, than the spectra do. And so this overall shape, this is referred to as the envelope. And, and another illustration of this is this famous experiment done by Berger. Uh, it's called the confusion matrix uh, uh, experiment. These wind instruments were recorded. And then from their waveforms, they clipped the beginning and the end, just a tiny portion. So when the sound begins, you have that rate of rise, the envelope. Also, you have various noises, various transient. Like when you pick a guitar, you have the click of the plectrum, the pick. Okay, or when you play a wind instrument, you have the hissing sound of the air. So you have these various noises and transients mixed with the tone itself. And those are more telltale for the timbre than the frequency, than the frequency spectrum. So when they did this, when they removed the, a little bit of the beginning and the end, they hardly changed the spectrum. But these professional musicians, they could not recognize their own instrument. So in the case of the flute, one person guessed it correctly. Two people thought it's an oboe. Six people thought it's a saxophone. So this is the point. So that very beginning and the end, getting all those timings, the transient, the rate of rise of the harmonic, that is more important than getting the frequency spectrum correct. Okay, so now uh, let's look at this quantitatively. Okay, fine, so timing is very important. How important? What, what, uh, 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 how accurate does the timing need to be for it to make no difference anymore? So let's look at this from the point of view of the frequency range of human hearing and see how far we can get with that. So the normal uh, human frequency range of hearing is 16 hertz to 18 kilohertz for young and healthy subject, usually rounded as 20 to 20 kilohertz. So if you view the period of the oscillation of the cycle as indicative of the time that you can hear, then that time, the period, is 1 over the frequency. So if you can hear up to 18 kilohertz, that's a time of approximately 50 microseconds. But the fact is, young and healthy subjects usually can't afford a high-end audio system. 
most audiophiles are older males and their hearing has declined with age. So as a result, uh, they're doing well if they can hear in the neighborhood of 10 kilohertz, not 18 or 20 kilohertz. That corresponds to a time of 100 microseconds. So you would think that if uh, uh, the timing errors were managed within 100 microseconds, you should be good. Are you? And what goes on in high-end audio? Let's take a look. So in high-end audio, they pursue this business of getting the timing correct, the temporal response correct, with a sort of fanatical uh, zeal. Uh, for example, this speaker system made by Wilson Audio, it has these different modules, each of which produces, uh, uh, produces a different frequency range. These can be moved in and out. The inset shows the mechanism to do that. And that's so that the wave fronts from all the different frequency ranges reach your ear at the same time. How accurately do they do it? This claims to have a synchronicity of 5 microseconds. And here's another example, an amplifier such as the one made by Spectral. This has a timing accuracy, a rise time <coughs> of a fraction of a microsecond. The frequency response that corresponds to is almost 2 megahertz. So when the, uh, these are the kind of measures that, are, that take place in high-end audio, and people kind of laugh at high-end audio because of that. They think it's an overkill. We just discussed that uh, most audiophiles can hear much uh, above 10 kilohertz. Therefore, times much less than 100 microseconds should not matter. Why are these people wasting effort and money and you know, the uh, purchase of money to uh, create all these uh, uh, super accurate uh, pieces of equipment, which it seems like uh, something that's unnecessary? That logic is wrong. This whole uh, notion that the temporal resolution should go, as a one over, should go as 1 over frequency, this applies to simple linear system. As you'll see, the hearing uh, or auditory system is anything but simple or linear. It's much more complicated. So before looking into the auditory neurophysiology and the how and why, uh, why you should hear for a few microseconds, first we needed to verify that you can hear a few microseconds. And we can't just take the word of the, ma uh, of the manufacturer that you need that kind of a precision. So experiments were done at the University of South Carolina where the, uh, you had two speakers that could be moved, kind of like the design of that Wilson speaker that you saw. And we actually measured the smallest misalignment that humans could hear. And that was two millimeters for average people who are not musicians and who are not audiophiles. If you take that distance and you divide by the speed of sound, you get the time that is uh, a few microseconds, about five microseconds. And a similar uh, experiment was done introducing the delay electronically, and in that case, headphones for you. Similar result. In that case, I think we got 4.7 microseconds. So this confirms you need accuracy of at least a few microseconds. But uh, how does that, how can you reconcile that with what we said earlier that the shortest period you can hear uh, it must be about 100 microseconds. If you're a kid with great hearing, 50 microseconds, but not 5 microseconds. So what's going on? So to understand that, we need to look into how our ears and our brain work together to produce the perception of sound. So let's take a look at the ear first. So sound goes into the ear uh, through the eardrum. It passes through a bunch of bones here and then it gets injected into the cochlea, which is in the inner ear. So the, within the cochlea, you have a basilar membrane. So here's that membrane. So this is a little a paper, a model made of the membrane. Normally, this is coiled up. As you can see, the, the cochlea, it looks like a snail. By the way, cochlea is the Latin word for snail. That's why it's called the cochlea. But to understand how the basilar membrane works, let's uncoil it and make it straight. Okay, so the basilar membrane is tapered. The end near the, the end, which is near the entrance where the sound comes in from, it is narrow. So the collagen fibers going across over here, they are shorter. Also, they are thinner and they're stiffer. The collagen fibers on the far end, they are longer and they're thicker and are less stiff. So you have less tension. So this looks like a harp or a piano where you have the bass strings here, which are longer and thicker, and you have the treble strings over here, which are thinner and shorter. Okay, so when sound comes in, depending on which frequencies are present, if you have high frequency, 
you'll get a vibration of the basilar membrane over here. If you have low frequencies, you'll have a vibration over here. So you are tuning by position, a process called tonotopy. And on this basilar membrane, you have the hair cells. Those little black dots that you have over here. So those are hair cells. Let's look at the slide again. So these are the hair cells. So what happens is when the basilar membrane moves up and down, the hair cells uh, move and they produce an electrical voltage. So these little hair cells, they work like microphone. And you have 4,000 rows of these hair cells across the basilar membrane. So because of the tuning by position, the tonotopy uh, as it's called, the different hair cells that produce uh, signals going down the nerves, those are uh, frequency selective. So depending on the position of the hair cell uh, uh, from which the nerves were fed, you can basically determine which frequencies were present. So this acts like a 4,000 frequency spectrum analyzer. There are roughly 32,000 auditory nerves coming out from the hair cells. Okay. Now, uh, each of these uh, hair cells, it has a dynamic range of 120 decibels. So in other words, if the, if the strongest sound, which is, is 120 dB, at, at that, uh, uh, that's the intensity, the maximum intensity, beyond which you risk uh, immediate damage to the hair cell, Compared to that, you can have some hair cells somewhere else. They could be moving with an intensity that's a trillion times less, 120 dB, 10 to the power of 12, trillion times less. And that would, leave, uh, that would lead to some signals coming down those nerves. So such a small minute difference. You have 4,000 channels, 32,000 nerves, and you have a dynamic range of one part in a trillion multiplied by 4,000. So a very, very minute difference over here uh, will give you a different pattern of nerve firing, what's called a neural activity pattern. So potentially that could lead to a different per uh, per perception of the sound. So as a result, it is very difficult for an audio system or, for, or an audio component to make absolutely no change that's inaudible. So people often talk about diminishing return. Once you go beyond a certain level or a certain price point, should all audio components not sound the same? Should you not have diminishing return? Absolutely not. So we are far from that point yet. In fact, personally, I have never heard an audio system which 100% uh, convinced me that there's a grand piano playing in front of me. We have a long way to go. The other uh, uh, important point to note is the extraordinary sensitivity of this apparatus. At zero dB, the, the sound that you can barely hear, that basilar membrane is moving up and down by one picometer. That's a thousand times smaller than a nanometer. That's a hundredth of a hydrogen atom. And you can hear that. So, so far we just talked uh, about the distribution of the frequency information across these auditory nerves. What about time? So that comes from some very sophisticated neural processing. So I'm going to give you a glimpse of the flow chart without really, it looks like this. I'm not going to discuss this, but it kind of should impress you at the amazing sophistication of neural processing that's going on. Within each of those boxes, by the way, there are lots of small boxes. I couldn't fit, fit them on this figure. But we are now going to focus on only one aspect of this whole thing. How the timing between different frequencies is uh, processed and compared. That, that takes place here in the PVCN and the VNLLV. So let's look at that now. So the way that works is the following. There's a neuron called an octopus neuron. So this is a photograph of the octopus neuron. So we took this when I was visiting the lab of Professor Donata Ortel in Wisconsin. And so this is the, the functional diagram of the octopus neuron. It works as a synchronous AND gate. Okay, so when different frequencies come in, they lead to a, an increase in the charge and the electrical voltage of this octopus neuron. But the way this neuron is designed, it has a leaky cell membrane. So if this frequency comes in first and the other one comes in a little bit later, the first charge will have leaked away and then the overall voltage and charge will not rise above threshold. The octopus will not fire. So this baby fires if all the frequencies come in at the same time. So it's basically a device for measuring the slew rate, the, the transient, the thing that uh, di uh, distinguishes a piano from a harpsichord. So now what's the probability that it's going to fire? That, uh, so we can combine the probability distributions of each of these frequency channels
to get the total probability. And you do that by multiplying them together. So the idea is like if you buy a lottery ticket in South Carolina, let's say you have a one in a thousand chance of winning. Then you buy a lottery ticket in Georgia, let's say you have a one in a thousand chance of winning. What's the probability that you'll win both of those tickets? It's one in a million. You multiply the probabilities together. So this was done mathematically. Again, I'm not going to go into the details of the math. Uh, you can read it in the published paper. But to make a long story short, at the end of the day, the day, yes, you can and should be able to hear a few microseconds. What's very notable about this whole calculation is that there is no mention about the maximum frequency you can hear. So there is not a direct connection between the highest frequency you can hear and the shortest time that you can discriminate uh, as a matter of perception. Okay, so, and furthermore, uh, as you age, you do lose the hair cell population. So that, that will re, uh, uh, worsen your time discrimination, your temporal resolution, but very slightly. You can lose half your frequency response from 18 kilohertz to 9 kilohertz. And all you will have lost in time discrimination is 5%. So therefore, in the time domain, your hearing is fairly robust. So this is a kind of, uh, it, it makes sense, a lot of elderly audiophiles, people wonder, this person can understand speech. The person can hear about 5 or 10 kilohertz. You know, what, what's he talking about that this amplifier sounds better than another amplifier that costs $10,000? In the time domain, that person still has the discrimination. That's happening in the brain, not in the ear. Okay. So to conclude then, first of all, there is this realm, this incredible uh, 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 level of audio called high-end audio, which goes far beyond the typical consumer audio level. So you owe it to yourself to find a high-end audio store or a friend who has a high-end audio system. Go listen to this thing. You'll be blown away. Okay. And secondly, the performance differences in high-end audio are not related to common specifications like the frequency response and harmonic distortion. Instead, what makes them different are things that happen in the time domain, and also it appears uh, certain types of noise as well. Then human temporal resolution is in microsecond, and it has no connection with the highest frequency you can hear. And uh, uh, if you have uh, time, you can go to my, my website. All these papers can be downloaded. We also have a couple of interesting results. Last year, we proved for the, for the first time in the 70-year history of stereo sound, the two-channel stereo can produce three dimensions, not just X, uh, left and right, not just depth, but also height. And the explanation for that is also in that paper. And then a paper which was just accepted by the journal, the Audio Engineering Society, it's in press right now, uh, that pr uh, uh, proves for the first time that the wires and the topology with which you connect two different components together, you know, th th these things, they can affect the quality of the sound. This again has been a very controversial uh, and hotly debated issue. Uh, how you connect components together, should that make a difference? The answer is yes. Okay, so let me stop with that and uh, you know, thank you for uh, watching and listening. Okay, so long. Bye-bye.